Crimes legislation is about to pass in one of the last states still standing, South Carolina. We are exposing insider info about the Uniparty's Party's plans to make South Carolina a one-stop shop of progressive politics. To slide hate crimes legislation in through the back door, the establishment has distracted the conservative wing of the Republican Party with a straw man argument over banning sex transitioning services for minors. We will be diving into the takeaways for the Iowa caucus as well. So let's get into it. Welcome to the 19th episode of the Magnifying Glass podcast. I am your host, Elena Moore, and I am joined today by the American Stoic. On today's episode, we are exposing what the Uniparty is doing, what the Uniparty does, except this time... We know what's going to happen before it actually happens. We will also be taking a look at the Iowa caucus and some of the hilarious takeaways that came from it. But first, let's start off with the most exciting piece of hate crimes because it just seems to continue coming up whether or not I like it. And it has come up apparently a lot in many other states, which is why South Carolina, I believe, Liam, isn't it there one other state other than the South Carolina that hasn't passed hate crimes yet? Uh, Arizona, uh, Arkansas and Wyoming are the only other two states. And then there are a couple okay. uh, territories. But yeah, it's basically uh, universal at this point. Right. And we even have in big cities like Greenville that have already put in different ordinances that are very similar to hate crimes. But we have not seen a full state law that has passed. Well, the funny thing about it is, just as a reminder, South Carolina legislature is a Republican supermajority. But it doesn't seem that red when the legislature has a similar voting record to one of the most liberal legislatures in the country which is Hawaii. South Carolina is notorious for being the most liberal red state in the country, basically, at this point. So what I'm about to say shouldn't surprise you, but it probably will. The South Carolina Senate is currently reviewing or will be reviewing last year's House Bill 3014, so that's 3014, which actually passed the House when session extended in May. But what is hate crimes? Let's just break it down really quick, which you can also find this information on Palmetto State Watch website in one of the articles we did last May. Hate crimes or intimidation laws represent an added penalty for offenses against crime victims specially designated to have protected status. The penalties are tacked onto charges already deemed appropriate under our legal system for an actual crime. The purpose of hate crimes law is to punish criminals for their words and intentions. That's really important there, your words and intentions. Since it is impossible to define a person's hateful thoughts, the text of hate crime laws is written in such a way that the that is left open for interpretation. Some believe that the vagueness is intended to give aggressive prosecutors more power and greater flexibility to punish targeted groups of lawbreakers. This leads to legitimate concerns that a perpetrator's race, political beliefs, opposition to government, or depth of religious conviction could be determined how harshly or if the laws are applied. I think that's the easiest way I can sum it up. Liam, do you have any thoughts on it? Well, I mean, it, it, it's a weird idea because you already, whenever you're going to pursue some criminal charges against an individual, you're already going to have to kind of go out on a limb and assess whether or not there was criminal intent on the on the part of the offender, which, you know, is, is already kind of a high burden of proof and already, you know, kind of raises some questions as far as how well can a judge or a jury, you know, determine that. To take that a step further and to say that, oh, the offender chose to victimize this individual because of their belonging to a protected class just seems to be, you know, just another step into trying to define the undefinable. Um, mm-hmm. And that and that kind of doesn't take into account the obvious opportunity for misuse, I'll say, to put it to put it nicely. The, the judicial system already has throughout the course of, you know, from it, from a, who a police officer can choose to arrest to uh, what charges the prosecutor can choose to level versus what the judge can decide in sentencing. 
there's so much discretion already afforded to the people in the judicial system that this almost just seems that, you know, obviously you're giving the aggressive prosecutors more, you know, more room to play there, but they already have so much. It, it really raises the question, is this necessary? And I'm not sure that it is because with all of the other rules, there's, there's a little bit governing it, right? So when yeah. it comes to charging somebody for manslaughter versus murder, you have very clear uh, burdens of proof that you as a prosecutor have to uphold if you think somebody should go away for 20 years and you need to get them for murder. Well, they have some protections against that in the sense that you now have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this was not unintentional in any way, et cetera. And so now you're just giving the ability of prosecutors to basically double and, and sometimes even you know a, a greater increase in the, in the amount of prison time that they could level on an offender really for no reason you know, if you, they don't like you. And so, and so that's just a, a huge problem, I think, constitutionally. Um, but we'll, we'll see how, if, if the courts address that going forward. Right. I mean, it could, it could really open it up to a lot of things. I've even seen multiple people say, you know, well, what about pastors? Because then you're just opening this up to anybody who says anything at any time to tack on if something's questionable. If an action and that's kind of and that's kind of leaving aside, you know, uh, and this, this applies also at the federal level too. So going back to what we said, that there's 47 states right now out of the 50 that have some form of hate crimes legislation on the books. Obviously, it differs by state, but there's also federal hate crimes, and and mm -hmm. and so you're just basically giving more and more power to the government to to come after private citizens, and it doesn't have to be, as you talked about in the quote, it doesn't have to be necessarily for a provable crime. You know, you mm -hmm. said that, oh, it can be used to, to basically add time onto a, a conviction. Well, it doesn't have to be that. You can go after somebody for just a hate crime. And yeah. and we saw that threat coming down on, on uh, if you look at the Derek Chauvin incident, there was a lot of leaks coming out of the Department of Justice. That, again, this is federal, not state level, but uh, the same principle applies that they were going to try and pursue, you know, hate crimes and civil rights violations charges against uh, Derek Chauvin if the jury ended up acquitting him in the state trial. So so it doesn't always have to be adding time on top of a known conviction even. It, 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 it provides the opportunity for a prosecutor to have even broader strokes whenever it comes to who they charge. I'm so glad you pointed that out because that is really what we are seeing here. And my concern is that many people in the South or in red states think everything's okay because of the color of their state. But really what you are seeing happening in these liberal blue states or just blue cities will be coming to you with laws like this. So, well, I mean, look at, look at the states that already have it. Florida already has hate crimes legislations. Uh, Texas, you know, what what's people consider very red states and, and, and not just, you know, the blue version of a red state, as yeah. you kind of alluded to earlier with South Carolina. You know, basically every deep red state has some form of this on the books. So it, it's not just, um, it's not just going to stay in New York City and Chicago and, and California. Like, and you're right to point that out. It's coming for you. And, and it kind of goes back to the way they're doing it there in South Carolina is mm -hmm. they're kind of distracting the people who should be watching yeah. And saying, "Hey, let's let's go argue about this other thing," and then while you're not looking, we're gonna we're gonna pass this other bill, which is just it's it's sad that that politics is that duplicitous. But mm -hmm. the people that that we elect, we need to make sure that they're aware that they need to be guarding against this. They yeah. can't just be focusing on one thing. You can't get tunnel vision. Yeah. So why did this actually pass the House last year in the South Carolina uh, legislature? That's what we all want to know. Well, because Republican lawmakers like Governor Henry McMaster have, and let me put this word in there just to be safe, have allegedly promised mega corporations like Volkswagen, who's coming in under a shell company of Scout Motors, that they will institute hate crime laws in order to convince these huge ESG companies to move into the state. It's been happening with them, and I also heard it's been happening with multiple others. I mean, I could name probably 15 different foreign companies that are moving in right now that are completely dependent on China, full of ESG legislation that comes from the Green New Deal, 
and they are being they are coming in and the way they want to come in is to have hate crimes promised to them and our uh legislators and elected officials in the state of south carolina are more than happy than to uh, roll out that red carpet for them the latest tip that we have received from the state house as we have alluded already through this episode is that republican leaders that i would consider part of the uniparty the establishment whatever you want to call them are planning to allegedly use a transgender bill to distract conservatives so they can pass hate crimes legislation through the senate Allegedly speaking, South Carolina Senate Minority Leader Brad Hutto plans to hold up the transgender bill in the Senate Judiciary Committee that he chairs so it will not pass, but it will create a alleged great distraction so they can allegedly pay, pass hate crimes legislation officially. So you got that? We got that already in our mind? All right, let's move on. It is also reported that allegedly speaking, Representative Justin Bamberg, who, by the way, is a Democrat from Bamberg County, will be taking all of the credit for hate crimes legislation when it is passed. A little bit of background info. You may find this hilarious. Uh, Justin Bamberg also shares the same uh, county as uh, Nikki Haley. Allegedly speaking, he, the pride and joy of South Carolina Republicans, the pride and joy. They're both from the same area. Who saw that? Well, he tweeted out the other night that he is willing to run on a split ticket with Nikki Haley and to bring America together. Oh, that's very generous of him. Isn't I can't it? believe that he, we have politicians this selfless that are willing to lay down their life like this for the Ameri the good of the Republic. That's Really inspirational stuff there, buddy. I mean, honestly, I had a tear to my eye. But I don't want to get off on too much of a He's rant He's just seeing all the fundraising money. He's like, millions and millions of dollars coming to me. I can spend name on name in lights in New York Times Square. Which That's what he wants. He doesn't have enough since he allegedly basically runs the county. But okay. Allegedly. Allegedly. A key word. Allegedly, remember that everybody. <laughs> are you having Are you having a spasm? Are you Are you having a stroke? I am. Are, are you okay? <laughs> okay. We'll let the viewers decide. Am I okay? I don't really know. Maybe I won't be after I finish reporting this. So the South Carolina Senate Minority Leader Brad Hutto, who is also a Democrat and is from Orangeburg County, which is right beside Bamberg County, allegedly is a staunch atheist along with his wife who is a pediatrician at MUSC and a local clinic. In case you don't know, MUSC is a huge leading hospital here in South Carolina who is allegedly a huge fan of child sex transitions and not telling parents uh, what is happening to their kids. But that's all allegedly, of course, so let's move on. What is the transgender bill? What are they planning to distract with or what are they currently distracting with? Because I will go ahead and be honest. I just got off listening to the house finish. I don't know how many hours. I don't, well, they haven't even finished yet, but they're in the middle of a very long debate over this transgender bill right here. This bill prohibits gender transition procedures to a minor. It prohibits the use of public funds for gender transition procedures, including uh, Medicaid, and prohibits st school staff from withholding knowledge of transitioning from parents. It has already received an insane amount of press, as the establishment correctly planned, and it was recently heard in the House Medical Committee. Many trans activists showed up and one even yelled at Representative Thomas Meach to go F himself, which you can see in this clip here. Hey, Meach, go fuck yourself. I thought his uh, retweet of that and adding a Edgar Allan Poe quote was my personal favorite. Uh, but moving on, that is basically what they plan to distract conservatives with. And it it does work. It's working. Uh, people are really riled up about it. They're very angry, understandably so. But what they don't know is that they are uh, the establishment is also working on passing hate crimes. Palmetto State Watch is publishing an article, and it will probably be published by the time this episode is 
also published, uh, that covers the details of hate crimes in South Carolina from our resident indoctrination expert. It will be published by the time it's out, so you will find the link in the footnotes for it. And if you do anything, read this article. You can also listen to it. Just click on the link and hit play at the top. If you would like any more information, we also did a two-part series as well that uh, was written back in May. Just so you know, let's bring this back around because it seems like a lot of information, wouldn't you say, Liam? Oh yeah. Well, and also there's two to there's two things you don't want to see made: laws and sausage, and we're dealing with uh, one of those right now. <laughs> well, I, or both. <laughs> I was gonna go there, but then I was, what are you making the sausage out of? You know, well, ask M U S C. Skin from your forearm. Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> All right, so let's get to our call of action. This can only pass if citizens don't bother calling their legislators. Radical progressives do make time to call and are currently working the phones to get this bill passed, to get hate crimes passed. As a result, our conservative representatives never hear opposition and no longer see harm in trading away our constitutional rights for whatever they're gaining during their House bargaining sessions. So call your Senate representative and encourage others to do so as well in South Carolina. People inside the legislature confirm that phone calls are extremely effective at influencing votes. We just did this last week when the majority and minority leader of the house in south carolina were working together to pretty much completely cut the legs off of the freedom caucus and not let them bring up any amendments it's working they still haven't brought up to the house it's because people are calling texting emailing that's what they do so if you don't want hate crimes in south carolina if you would like to hold out a little bit longer with being a liberal red state let's do our best to not let this get passed. On that note, let's turn it to something a little bit lighter. Maybe a little bit of a win a little for, for a change. It would um, be nice. Well, dep de depending on which side of the Republican primary you land on, I, I guess I shouldn't assume uh, that everybody is, is on the same boat on that. But as everybody probably knows, the Trump basically swept Iowa. Technically, he lost one of 99 counties by one vote, Johnson County, which is just incredible that 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 some individual in Johnson County, Iowa, by instead of voting for Trump, voting for Haley, prevented a 99 county sweep. Uh, quite funny. Can you imagine but, the one or two Trump supporters who said, oh, no. He's going to win. Let me just stay inside in Johnson County. And did okay, it go well, to the polls? In their defense, it was like negative like 100 degrees and there was a billion car accidents. So I'm not totally going to fault people for, for staying home. But it would be nice if you could at least like tie it up, get one more person there. Uh, but, but I digress. Anyway, so there's a couple fun things out of this. Obviously, Vivek... Ramaswamy dropped the dropped the following day, and then the following day after that was on a stage at a Trump rally in New Hampshire. So we're going to quickly see this race kind of pare down, basically. But I, I wanted to stick on some of the delusional takes from the Democrats just just for a moment. I won't I won't harp on this for too long, but I just want you to take a look at this map of Iowa. All of the kind of you know regular fire engine red is trump counties these are counties that voted for trump and they have one county there in the in the middle that is a darker shade of red and that's the one county that nikki haley won by one vote as i mentioned earlier that's johnson county uh to east of des moines now i want you to look at that and then think oh yeah that looks like the narrowest margin of victory ever in the republican iowa caucus now you may think that i'm being absurd <laughs> I promise you, I am not. There is a real individual out there, and not just a random egg on Twitter, a person with almost 300,000 followers on Twitter, uh, the youngest de uh, Biden delegate from 2020, co-host of multiple political shows. Uh, he was a comms intern uh, for the DNC, um, and a number of other very high-level Democratic operations. In all of his infinite wisdom, this UCLA student, oh no way, former intern at the White House, tweeted out, and it's still up. Like it's not he he didn't get embarrassed and delete this. This is still up. Uh, four days later, th two days later, excuse me, 
Wow, time flies. Uh, he says, quote, can the media please stop saying tonight was a win for Donald Trump? Trump's margin of victory was the smallest of any Republican candidate in American history. Half of caucus goers voted against him, and he's standing on trial tomorrow as a sexual abuser. Trump is a loser. I'm going to leave aside the whole absurdity of the last part about the ongoing cases against Trump, and, and we'll probably do another so episode on that for, sometime. So uh, proven, um, you know, guilt, yeah. Innocence before proven guilt. I just want to focus on Trump's margin of victory was the smallest of any Republican candidate in American history. Not only is that false, that could not be more false, actually. It was the largest margin of victory in the Republican Iowa caucus. But Liam, history. how do you know that? And it didn't edge it out. And it didn't edge it out. It wasn't close. It wasn't like Johnson County for Nikki Haley. It wasn't by one vote, okay? It was 300% of the second closest margin of victory in the Iowa Republican caucus's history. Okay, the, the next closest, Trump won by 30 points. The next closest was in 2000, George W. Bush won Iowa by 11 points. Again, part of this is just because of the way the caucus works. It's generally just going to be a little bit of a tighter race. It's the first one. So, you know, you generally see people win Iowa and then go on to be completely irrelevant the rest of the race. So it's not always, you know, important. I think I, think, I believe Ted Cruz won Iowa in 2016. Obviously, we know how his campaign ended up in 2016 being accused of being the son of the Zodiac Killer. Anyway, so the fact that, that this tweet is out here from a high-level uh, Democratic operative just goes to show you that these people are not serious. These people are completely making stuff up as they go. And there's no accountability for it. I mean, you just have to think that if somebody tweeted out that, oh, I don't know, Biden was maybe didn't get 81 million votes, right? I don't think Biden got 81 million votes, allegedly, allegedly. right? Now, if I, if I said something like that, I would get fact-checked. I would get community noted. Underneath this video, you would have a disclaimer from Wikipedia claiming that what I'm saying is a complete falsehood and that you should not listen to me because I am not a trustworthy source. What does this man get for completely bending the facts all out of whack? How much? How Nothing. many followers? No correction. I just want to know. Almost 300,000. Also, look, I don't want to sound like I'm jealous because I'm not, okay? I have like three brain cells to rub together. He has 300,000 followers. So, look, we all have our own battles. But how do you get 300,000 followers by being this wrong? I I just want to know. I, it's, I'll, I'll move on. Leaving behind the dismal performance of this democratic operative uh there are a few other takeaways that that we have going going forward uh, obviously trump outperformed any expectation that that people really had going into iowa there was there was murmurings you know people like dave rubin they're like oh all right here's DeSantis. he's gonna win iowa okay it, it's it's over the race is over N news bulletin people the race is over <laughs> you're never gonna catch him it's literally impossible for anybody to win this race outside of Trump. Uh, Nikki Haley obviously embarrassed herself with, I, I say the dumbest thing she's ever said, but by the time this episode is out, she'll have said something dumber because this woman has been turning out bad takes like she works I'm, at ESPN, I'm sure she's okay? saying something right now on Twitter that's even worse and we have no idea right, right now. Right now. Right now. Something about high heels. Maybe guns, I don't know. Ammo? Okay. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, and she said that she was uh, that Iowa made it clear, Iowa made it clear. Don't don't you forget, Iowa made it clear that this is a two. Whoa, whoa, race. whoa, whoa, whoa! She came in third. I don't know what so she Ron means DeSantis by this. So Ron DeSantis and Nikki uh, uh, Trump. That's what she means. That's a two person. Evidently, that's also not a race. No, um, but it's closer than her and Trump. I. I don't know what she thought she meant by that. I don't know if her her aides lied to her and was like, oh, you're in second place. I don't know. Maybe she didn't know. Maybe she was ignorant. Don't say anything sexist here. Uh -oh. But it's just this woman is a walking gaffe. She's like Biden, 
but instead of being senile, that's she's so just nice dumb. of you. Honestly, I was really expecting something worse. That's pretty bad. If you're like, I don't know, one hundredth the age of Biden, and you're at the same level of mental like capacity, that's a pretty bad insult. I can't think of many things that would hurt my feelings worse. But well, she doesn't have feelings. Anyway, as we move forward, New you got New Hampshire coming up, and then you have South Carolina after that. Uh, I know that CNN just canceled the debates. This race is just devolving. This race is over. Well, you I saw what happened agree. on MSNBC, the lesbian lady, or, well, she, I don't know. That's, Mad yeah, Dog I don't Mad know Al. what her name is. She stuck in my head as the lesbian lady, and I think she'll always be in my head as that. Which is hard to tell because, you know, there's multiple women on MSNBC. So you take your pick of which one you think I'm actually talking about. But she said that MSNBC will not be showing any speeches from Trump anymore because of his authoritarian speech that resembles, I believe she used the N-word, Nazis. Yeah. Oh, that N word. I thought I got you there. Uh, yeah, yeah. The MSNBC panels really have been losing their minds. Uh, uh, Joy Reid claiming that it was it was white evangelicals that wanted minorities to bow down to them. That's why they voted for Wait, Trump. Wait, isn't That's that why, why Biden won though? Because it was the white evangelical women. Uh, yes, but allegedly leaving that point, that very, very, very adept point. Uh, to the side for the second. My favorite thing about this is that she said it with a blonde wig on her head. That is a different lady. But, yep, that works, too. I think they were both talking. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no. I think you're talking about Maddow. I was talking about Joy Reid. Both of them are in the running for the dumbest person on television. What we really need is we need to add Nikki Haley, have the three of them do a panel, and call it the Three Stooges. And just oh, I think let we should add run. all of Biden's press secretaries on there as well if we're going to go that low. I forgot about them. That's painful. That's a team from hell. You got a starting five. You got a basketball team. You might oh, actually be no. for euthanasia that's, that's... now. Margaret Sanger is like, I can hear her in the back of my head now. <laughs> But yeah, so so leading in New Hampshire, obviously DeSantis is kind of skipping New Hampshire. Uh, he says that he wants to challenge Nikki Haley in, in her state of South Carolina. Uh, I, I think that what that really just means is he doesn't think he has a chance. He was trying to blame the weather in New Hampshire, but I mean, coming out of Iowa, I don't understand how you can do that. Uh, again, these, these people are really just taking every last breath they can in this race to try and get suck a few more donor dollars out of out of the air, and then they're all just going to disappear. Yeah, and I had no idea DeSantis was even coming to South Carolina. I found out afterwards when he did a video with one of the most establishment of establishments in the House, Bill Taylor, talking about how they're pushing ESG uh, anti-ESG legislation. What? It's one of those. It's one of those issues where I'm just left with the question for Chris Christie, for Nikki Haley, for Ron DeSantis, for everybody. Why are you still running? And 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 this isn't this isn't about oh you you have to support Trump for it. It's just a waste of money and energy and time. Like I live in Florida. I want DeSantis to go back to being the governor of Florida. I want him to be an effective governor for the rest of his term rather than running around in South Carolina and New Hampshire fighting an impossible battle trying to beat Trump. Nobody's going to beat Trump. Floridian tax and I think that for- yeah, and so it's it's just been one of those issues, and, I, and a lot of like Floridians feel that way, and and I think across the country people just kind of feel that way, where everybody knows it's over, and so this exercise in futility is really just frustrating. So I think I speak for everybody in the Republican base, like just quit, it's over. You may not be happy about it. I mean, I get it. You lost a campaign, but it's over. Good night. The fat lady has sung. It's over. 
Thank you for joining us today on the Magnifying Glass podcast. We delve deep, bringing the overlooked into focus and magnifying the stories that matter to you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and share, helping us shine a light on even more discoveries. I'm your host, Elena Moore, and remember, sometimes the smallest details make the biggest difference. Until next time, keep looking closer. Thank you.